Are you really intolerant to oxalates? Let's talk about it. Hey health heroes, welcome back to Adam Immune, the channel about helping you improve your health naturally. Today I read, well I get these emails from Sarah Ballantyne, the paleo mom. I'm on her email list. Well, today I seen this article and it's called, Is Oxalate Sensitivity Real? So I just thought we would read the article together and go over some stuff and maybe we can learn um, more about this. Um, now a lot of people think, you know, they are oxalate sensitive and it turns out maybe it's something else. So, you know, what could actually be triggering us? Is it oxalates? Is it the spinach? Maybe it's something else. Let's figure it out together. So again, the article is called, Is Oxalate Sensitivity Real? I think that this is just to capture our attention. Obviously we know it's real, um, but maybe it's something else, right? That's what she alludes to here. So she talks about oxalates and that it's actually an organic acid salt and that it's naturally occurring in plants and that it also can be produced endogenously. Oh God, I can't say this word guys. Endogenous, endogenously? Endogenously, sure, within our bodies, right? Um, from a metabolism of vitamin C, glycinate, glycolate, and hydroproxylene. Um, so it's in it's in our foods, but it's also something that our body naturally re naturally makes itself. These high oxalate foods are leafy greens, beet greens, spinach, chard, endive. I don't know what that is. Endive. I don't know, let me know what that is. I, I, I've never had it. Dandelion greens, kale, purslane, again, another one I haven't had. Um, watercress, turnip greens, and collard greens. I've had some turnip greens lately, and I kind of like kale chips. I bake them in the oven really good. Maybe not quite as bitter as kale, so I like that. Um, they got to be salty, though. They're not good. Um, most berries, most nuts, tea, made from real tea leaves. Beetroot, cassava. Yeah, I didn't know cassava was at first. Um, I, used, I, I used to have a lot of that. Um, I don't do much of that anymore after I found out that it's actually toxic or poisonous if it's raw. I don't like to eat a lot of foods that are poisonous in nature. White potatoes, obviously I don't eat those. Sweet potatoes, carrots, rhubarb, parsley, broccoli, cabbage, okra, chocolate, beetroot. Again, a lot of these foods aren't AIP, but for the average American, like the standard American dieter, spinach, potatoes, and nuts. Um, it says 44% of our total oxalate intake comes from these three foods, which is interesting. Um, I, I mean, I, in the before time, I did not eat a lot of spinach. Definitely a lot of potatoes, though. And I did not know they were high in oxalates, so that's interesting. Um, I only ate the white ones in the before time. I don't even think I had a sweet potato unless it was like Thanksgiving or canned yams or something, which do not taste like the regular sweet potatoes. I love the Hannah sweet potatoes, the white ones. Really good. I get them organic at Whole Foods. Highly recommend. Unfortunately, many people have been scared away from eating high oxalate foods due to concerns about oxalate sensitivity. Although there's no official medical definition for oxalate sensitivity, it typically tip I can't talk today. It typically refers to a tendency to develop kidney stones and or muscle and joint pain as a result of eating high oxalate foods. So, I mean, I just want to say right now like a giant warning. Look, she talks a lot about that and I can respect that, you know, that's good science, but you could have any symptom from a different trigger or sensitivity or intolerance. Um, Jordan Peterson, for one, I mean, I remember he went down to basically carnivore, but with leafy greens. Like, he limited everything but the greens and meat. And he was having horrible depression. I mean, I remember this, this seemed really important to me at the time. And it wasn't until he just cut out those leafy greens where his depression disappeared. So I'm like, I'm not saying it was even an oxalate thing, but just something to keep in mind. It might not just be um, what everybody else experiences. It might be something crazy like brain inflammation and depression or anxiety or something like that, okay? With me, I'm very uh, sensitive to like anxiety. I'll get anxiety if I eat a trigger food or something I don't react with. So um, a little bit of dizziness, things like that, that'll trigger that. So just keep in mind, we're all a little bit different in how we um, show our, our, how we trigger, right? Uh, but that's something you kind of have to trial and error and figure out. Um, so she goes on to talk about a lot about kidney stones and all this and you know maybe eating some citric acid and fruits to alleviate that and that that helps quite a bit. I don't eat a lot of foods. Well, I eat a lot of uh, berries I'll say and they do have some citric acid but the most citric acid foods are like lemon and you know oranges and stuff. I don't do those. Um, again, high histamine foods, right? Um, and I just don't react well to those. And then later on, she gets into that. That oxalates might actually be a histamine 
or a solicitate issue, okay? So it might not actually be oxalate after all because a lot of the foods that we cut out that are high in oxalates happen to be high in solicitates or histamines, okay? Now, this is something that we you know, in the uh, natural healing community know a lot about, you know, eliminating foods and having something you think you're actually intolerant to and you, uh, you know, months or years later you figure out, oh, it wasn't this, it was, it was actually this, I was, it was the histamines. So, I mean, that is something we have to be aware of because we don't want to cut out a food that we could possibly get some nutrients from or enjoy, right, if we don't have to, right? Why cut out a food if it's perfectly fine for you, right? That's why I don't necessarily recommend everybody go to straight carnivore right uh, right off the bat right because there's foods that help you in being consistent not everybody can just eat meat and salt and water right not everybody can do that so I mean some people can surely and they have great I'm not saying you can't do that and be healthy I'm absolutely not saying that as an animal based guy but what I am saying is that's probably not the smartest way to start out and as a health consultant yes I do do health consultants DM me on my Instagram um, I I think that's not the best way to do it okay I mean for for people that are in a lot of horrible pain and they want to speed it up that going animal base that's smart but going hundred percent carnivore I don't know I don't know about that one uh, now that's why I usually recommend eating just a few foods five seven ten foods you know don't be eating 50 a variety of 50 different vegetables sent from all around the country that's not very smart okay you're never gonna find remission if you do that I can't believe how many times I have to tell people that uh, should we avoid high oxalate foods well again she's saying no because some of these foods are the highest nutrient dense plants okay not highest nutrient dense foods but plants right so like foods like spinach are yeah they have some nutrients um, but they're not necessarily like dense compared to like you know liver or something like that I think we all can agree on that so you know there are people that are prone to kidney stones and there are um, certain diseases that people are prone to genetically um, that do have to cut this out and she she goes on to say that you know it is actually very rare to have an oxalate sensitivity um, but I want to argue that not necessarily. Like, this says one in three million people actually have an oxalate sensitivity, but like, how are they figuring that up? Like, they can't even diagnose most of us properly. How do they know how many people have this in a million people? So, I just want to go out there and, and say, you know, all this is, it's based on theory, it's good, it's good, you know, that's the science we have right now. We go off of what we know with science, right? But I think if we use a little bit of speculation and, and critical uh, thinking, I think we know that a lot of us are intolerant to a lot of things that um, medical science just hasn't caught on to yet, right? So let's assume it's a lot more than that, okay? There are a lot of you listening right now that are definitely oxalate sensitive. You can't have spinach, you can't have other things. Uh, just know that you're not alone, uh, but you got to do the trial and error and figure out what works best for you. Let me read a little bit of this, okay? Because some of it really makes sense. While it's true that people, uh, may, many people feel better after switching to a low oxalate diet, at least anecdotally, and I think, I, I know it's not scientific, but anecdotal, I mean, I have healed <laughs> listening to a lot of anecdotal science, okay? So, I mean, don't discard it. But many, and I, I would say she would say that as well. I mean, but she's, you know, she's kind of coming from a science background. She's very smart, and that's that's a good way to go, especially if you're teaching people science, the science behind these um, natural healing um, methods. Many high oxalate foods are also rich in two other problematic compounds, histamine and solicitate. Um, in fact, some of the highest oxalate foods are also high in histamine. Spinach, strawberries, and tea. Um, they're the high histamine foods, right? And I would say, you know, the strawberries aren't necessarily high histamine. They're, um, they have this like enzyme or something in them that releases the histamine in your body, right? Um, so, you know, it floods your body with histamine, not necessarily coming from that. I do recommend if you do eat strawberries, eat them organic. I eat them frozen. I think that's going to have less histamines. I think that's just a good way to do it. That's why I eat most of my fruit frozen. But yeah, tea, again, a lot of people don't know this, but like tea is high in histamines, okay? It's dry, it's like herbs, right? Dry leaves, but they're dried and aged. Anything that's like dried and just sits around for whoever knows how long is has high in histamines, guys. That's why I don't do a lot of seasonings here. I have in the past, but I don't really do anymore. I do mostly just salt. I like to get my food really fresh. That's the best way to go. Go get some local meat from your local butcher. That's, that's a good way to go. Um, and go to your local farmer's market and make friends with gardeners and friends and people that are local that have 
plants and are organic and don't use a lot of pesticides and all that good stuff, okay? Just, just be careful of the quality of food. And the vast majority of high oxalate foods are also high in silicitate, including berries, broccoli, coffee, tea, sweet potatoes, beets, carrots, white, white potatoes, spinach, carrots, and almonds. Now, I know a lot of those aren't AIP foods, you guys are eating them, but some of them are. And I know a lot of AIP people that have reintroed almonds and, and things like that, and white potatoes, and doing fine. But just be aware, uh, silicitate's also, with that, it's coconut. A lot of people are coconut intolerant, so it's probably the silicitates. But keep in mind, I think this was one of the main reasons I want to tell you guys this. It might be something else, too. It might not just be histamines. And I think she, she's, she doesn't talk about that, but I mean, I think it's it's implied, right? Or at least that's what I'm inferring because I know from experience that a lot of people are triggered by all kinds of things, all right? It might not be the oxalates or the histamines in the spinach or whatever, right? It might actually be the fiber, right? A lot of people just can't eat hardly any fiber. Um, a lot of people don't talk about this in the paleo community because it sounds bad. Like, ooh, fiber, ooh, look, why are we scared of fiber? Like, fiber's good, it feeds your good gut bacteria, right? Probiotics, but prebiot prebiotics, all this stuff. But keep, and, and resistant starches like sweet potatoes. But guys, some people just can't do it, okay? So keep in mind, a lot of people do go animal-based, like me, because they just can't digest a lot of fiber. It doesn't matter where it's from. Sometimes it does, though. Sometimes it does. There are different kind of fibers. There are different kinds of starches, okay? Your body can break down some stuff and not the others. Like, I can deal with more fiber from, like, fruit than I can from a vegetable, right? So just be aware of that as well. Okay, um, I don't know. I think I mean she's mostly like plant-based. She's like one of them pushing for that, but also eating organs. So I I really respect Sarah Ballantyne for that. And I also did get some good information from her one time. I think it was Sarah Ballantyne where she was talking about how fish had um, you can actually get like prebiotic fiber from animal protein, right? There's like this fiber-like. Um, say material in meat as well that acts like prebiotics and feeds your good gut bacteria so I, that's what started me on that animal based thing like what do we actually need plants well a lot of a lot of carnivores obviously don't think we do um i don't we're, we're obviously not like carnivores we might be obligate carnivores but we're not like made to be carnivores strictly right we probably can eat mostly meat and be totally fine i mean that's that's like how we convert we can we get our nutrition mostly it's more bioavailable right but if we eat a lot of plants we have to convert them which is fine but i see it more like as a backup system right like we don't eat have to eat a ton of these right a little bit is fine a little bit goes a long ways and some people convert better than others in certain things right so you might find out i mean how do you figure out what you convert better i don't know but i guess when you start eating a food and you feel really amazing I mean, there's your trial and error, elimination diet. This is what you have to do, right? Um, that's kind of the gold standard right now. Believe me, if there was a better way, I'd be pushing, guys. If you could eat like me, 100%, eat grass-fed beef, butter, and berries, and some cheese, you know, like, I would be pushing that. But that's just not for everybody. We're all got to figure out what's best for us. You may have an oxalate sensitivity. You might not. But hopefully you guys figure it out and go from there, okay? Uh, but just remember, spinach isn't you know inherently evil um but it is one of the on the uh what is it the dirty dozen foods with the highest pesticides and herbicides um along with strawberries so some foods need to be organic okay i do i do press people to be more organic on some foods some foods are never genetically modified and never use any pesticides or or herbicides on them so it's some, just something you don't have to worry about so definitely look up the dirty dozen and the clean 15 if you want to figure out what those foods are um, there are uh, websites that actually talk about that uh, every year they update it so maybe I'll do a video if you want to see that um, it's pretty interesting and I like to keep updated on that so if you guys enjoyed this um, definitely drop a like thanks for watching see you next time Better, there's no doubt about it. And my days are brighter, my shoulders are so much lighter. Just for a moment.